In today's conversation, I am joined by psychotherapist Emma Reed Terrell, who is the author of this book, What Am I Missing? In it, she, she showcases the four different types of profiles that she uses during her therapy to help people get a greater understanding of their personality types and why they think and behave in the way that they, that they do. We, we discussed during our conversation today the profiles of the gladiator, the hustler, the rock, and the bridge. The different personality types and, and in all honesty, how they reflect in ourselves and the people in our lives. We also discuss blind spots and how as we grow from tiny infants absorbing and interacting with the life that we find ourselves born into, we can also close off different parts of our brains so that we don't see certain actions and behaviors that really aren't serving us or that perhaps we can open ourselves up to to give us a more fully rounded and more joyful experience as we progress through life. The reason Emma's book is called What Am I Missing is because this is the key question that most of her clients come to her asking. What is it that I'm not seeing either in myself or in my life or in others that is causing me some kind of pain? You're going to love our conversation today. No matter what profile you fit, you are going to come away with answers to questions you didn't even know you had. Enjoy. Hello. Thank you for having me. I can't wait to have this conversation. And what a great name for what we're about to do, a conversation. (laughs) Could it be any more human than that? Could it be? (laughs) And let's dive straight in with this whole thing of, of what am I missing? Because... When I when I really started digging into the book, and yeah, I will admit, I I have a I have a really deep rooted fascination with human behaviour and why we do what we do, why we make the decisions that we make, how we come to the conclusions that we do, um, and I've I've always been like an amateur sleuth when it comes to psychotherapy or psychology and this kind of thing, and like I said in the in the intro there. If we're honest, most of the time we do it because we we are interested to see how this you know affects us. So I wanted to, before we dive in, really get a, a, an an idea as to what brought you to this space in the first place. Why did you decide to professionally uh, dive into psychotherapy? Oh. Well, thank you for that question, because as soon as you started talking, I was like, yes, amateur sleuth. That's that really resonates with me. That idea of just being someone who starts to get really curious and puts the pieces together. I would argue, do we do it because, you know, we want to find out more about other people and ourselves? Yes. But do we do it because actually, I think deep down on a kind of evolutionary level, it's a very protective skill to have to be able to start to get curious about people and their reactions and why they do what they do and for me that was the that was the kind of catnip that was the bit where I had grown up in a family setting where actually my mother's Swedish my father was a vet it was a a family of kind of scientific vikings there wasn't a huge amount of kind of emotional conversation happening we were very practical pragmatic people And that worked brilliantly and got me through lots of different situations with lots of resilience and lots of different problem solving techniques until I got to my 20s. And I found myself working actually uh, for Procter & Gamble. It was a sales and marketing role. And I just burnt out. Something changed. Something changed for me. It happened overnight. And I found myself phoning up their, their employee assistance line, which if you work in those kind of big corporates is quite often a sort of instant access support line whether it's therapy or finance or legal advice and suddenly I was in therapy so there I was at 23 having gone from thinking and doing my way through life to suddenly getting curious about this idea of feeling my way through life fast forward I'd done various different personal development courses and thought how on earth do people get through life without therapy and I think bit by bit, I just started to get more and more curious. So I did some gestalt courses. I did some transactional analysis. I did some integrative work. Next thing I knew, I was qualified as a therapist. It literally happened somehow kind of in my subconscious. I just became curious enough that it became a profession. Maybe that's how it was meant to be for me. I love that answer because it's. It, I think it's so much more powerful when you arrive at a destination 
through your own personal journey rather than just you know just thinking oh yeah that sounds like it's a good job that's like wanting to be a car mechanic or something like that when you're when you're working in the in the field of of human thought action behavior feeling it you bring so much more to the table when you've had your own personal experiences through it which is why so many people you know who end up working as life coaches or something like that they've been through their own journey as as counselors working for charities like the samaritans or something like that when you bring your own lived experience and place it alongside your alongside your learned experience and your learned knowledge it makes you a much more fully rounded professional and it makes you brilliant at, at what you do and that's why you know Everyone <laughs> is going to love what we're going to dive into into here. So I know when we we actually met for the first time only like a week or so ago. Yes. So I came along to your to your book launch just so that I could you know oh, say hi in, I in know. Real life before yes. we actually did this. And um, one of the things that was was so lovely was we we started talking about this whole idea of why you decided to. Um, cluster together, if you like, the four main types of of personalities that people come to you with because it made it easier, therefore, to work out solutions to the problems that they come to you with. Because everybody who who has any kind of coaching, counseling, therapy, whatever, it's normally there's, there's a bump in the road, there's a knot they need to untangle, and that's why they come to see you. So first of all, talk us through the four profiles that you came up with and explain what they mean. Okay, thank you. Yes, because the profiles for me are gateways. What I'm not saying is this defines you. And actually, I think anyone worth their salt in mental health or personal development recognises that labels are only as useful as the way we apply them. But there is something so helpful about having an access point, understanding packages of thoughts, feelings and behaviours. So that's what the profiles are for me. They are these packages And typically, I find that people sit more in one than the others, but there can be a blend. And they came to me and I started to understand them firstly as the rock. So I'll I'll talk you through the four profiles. There's the rock. The rock is someone who, if I was to say to them, do you have needs? They'd quite likely look at me blankly. There's something about, I'm a rock. I am self-sufficient, I'm self-reliant, I'm somebody who is independent, I'm thick-skinned, I'm broad-shouldered, people come to me for help. Actually, I'm a resource. I'm the one that people turn to in a crisis. I'm the shoulder to cry on. I'm the fixer. This the problem-solving capacity of a rock knows no bounds. And the thing about a rock is they are great in a crisis, but sometimes they need a crisis to be great. And that's where we start to understand actually what a rock is missing, because what a rock is missing typically is vulnerability. They don't necessarily have access to their own feelings. They get busy with feelings of other people sometimes. They're quite often the rescuers in society, but they get busy with other people's feelings kind of actually to avoid their own. They probably haven't had a lot of experience of their own feelings and being kind of encouraged to inquire about what's going on for them. So they can come across as aloof. They can come across as emotionally detached. They can come across as a bit stony or cold hearted at times. But all of this is a kind of self-preservation mechanism for them because they're not used to that vulnerability piece. And I hold my hands up. I was absolutely a rock growing up. My mother is the original rock. I think there really is something about that kind of Scandinavian heritage that's about self-reliance and not burdening anyone with anything and fixing things yourself. And one of our kind of family folklore stories is that when she was pregnant with my brother and she was at the end of her pregnancy, my father came home from work and found her carrying a manhole cover down the road because she thought it might be useful at some point and it had been discarded. And there was something about she was, for me, the epitome of strength, impassivity and zero need, zero vulnerability. And I think that modelling that I got really kind of went through into my desire to help others and maybe miss my own feelings. Takes us back to being 20 and burning out and finding out that I did have feelings after all. But let's look at the second profile. That's our gladiator. The gladiator is the profile that I see least often in therapy, which doesn't mean that they are least present in society, far from it. But the gladiator typically, if I said to them, do you have needs? They'd go, yeah, sure. And I'd say, 
You need people to help you meet them? Nope, I take what I need. There is something about a gladiator that's a very, very confident, very determined, ambitious, powerful person. They are somebody who believes in their own worth. They, they make demands on the world, sometimes to the detriment of their loved ones, because sometimes their demands make them seem a little selfish, bullish, maybe even a bit cutthroat at times. But actually, it's in service of leadership and driving things forwards and getting results. So you see these people quite often in leadership roles. There are CEOs, there are gladiators who are maybe taking no prisoners and suffering no fools, but sometimes actually need to learn how to, in terms of what they're missing, develop some empathy. Gladiators are great fun in therapy because typically they come under duress. They've been dragged by a partner or as a result of something going wrong at work. And the strengths of that therapeutic relationship comes from actually being able to build trust because typically gladiators struggle to trust. They're used to doing things by themselves and taking what they need because they haven't necessarily had unconditional support. Maybe things have come with a bit of a, a sting in the tail or a quid pro quo. So that's our gladiator. Profile number three, that's our hustler. Now the hustlers are fantastic creatures. These hustlers are energetic, they're creative, they're flexible, they're adaptable. They're really great at charming a room. They're really great at negotiation. They're really fleet of foot and agile in terms of the way that they look for solutions and the way that they get their needs met. When I say to them, do you have needs? Yeah, definitely. Do you ask people for help? Not directly. This is the person who actually kind of pulls strings at the edges or tries to influence other people rather than maybe stamp over others like a gladiator could or say what they need directly. So sometimes, without meaning to, our hustlers can actually be a bit manipulative at times. They're sometimes the people pleasers in the world who've worked out how to organize the reactions of other people to get what they need, not to do harm, but because maybe they don't have the confidence that they're allowed to have things the way they want them. So when we look at what they're missing, sometimes we recognize that actually it's acceptance that's in their blind spot. Self-acceptance, the belief that they are allowed to be here, that they are paid up members of this society and they can also speak their minds and have a voice. For some reason, there are so many hustlers in my life. And I think it's partly that rocky part of me. There's something really complimentary when you start looking at rocks and hustlers and how they work together, because there's this little give and take that happens when we start bringing the profiles together. The whole point of the book was me trying to help people understand that, yes, there's something we're missing in these profiles, but my goodness, are there strengths that we can start to play to? Let me tell you about the fourth profile. That's the bridge. So the bridge is someone who definitely has needs, wouldn't dream of taking from others to get what they want, actually wouldn't even feel comfortable necessarily doing that kind of working the room from the wings piece like a hustler would. Actually, our bridge typically accepts things as they're offered to them. So they really are that more easygoing character in a relationship. We probably see them and we describe them as calm and cooperative and collaborative and flexible and laid back. And actually what we're also describing is somebody who perhaps has learned to take up very little room. In fact, only the amount of space that is made for them and to work out how to change their shape to fit the space that they find themselves in. So sometimes in terms of what a bridge can be missing, it's actually about having power, not power over others but power over themselves, that really kind of empowered piece of being able to say, you know what, I actually have an opinion here too. You know what, there's something I want. So the bridges are the ones that we find, I don't know, coming along to the cinema and we say, what would you like to see? And they say, I don't mind. And we say, okay, sure, but you, uh, I chose last time, how about you choose? And they go, oh, anything, really, I'm just happy to be here. And maybe we actually find ourselves starting to get frustrated with that bridge. And we say, seriously, I want to know what you want. Uh, well, you like action films, right? Let's do that. Sure, I like action films. Let's do that then. Okay, we'll, uh, I'll buy the tickets. Okay, well, I'm getting the popcorn. There's something that's really hard for that bridge in terms of being 
active in roles. Unfortunately, they can get strapped into the passenger seat of life. And through the very efforts they make to not upset anybody, actually, they can end up causing friction and frustration because they never show up. So in terms of what they're missing, it's that power so that actually other people aren't left with the responsibility for them. What's so useful about those those profiles and and you describe them so brilliantly is that as you were as you were doing it yes of course there's a there's a part of us is like which one is me and and this sort of thing but instantly i could recognize friends family Uh people that i know ah they're a gladiator oh my gosh definitely a rock and and this kind of thing and it's interesting that you say that your mum was a rock because i realized actually gosh that's my mum as well and so much of that passed on to me and I thought that was how uh, one should behave in in relationships in life and in in this kind of thing and yet also a big part of me I realized was a hustler because I'm I am energetic I am full of ideas but also it comes like it's like dragging a rock around a room because (laughs) I'm also quite shy and I'm not brilliant at whilst inside I I have slightly golden retriever like but I am also nervous about you know taking up space or expressing it so it's a weird kind of messy juxtaposition which clearly I think now I'm you know I'm a bit older now so I've worked my way through it but listening to like say all those different profiles when people come to you the 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 main question that you you end up working through which is why it's the title of your book is what am I missing yeah and what what struck me when you were describing the the profiles is that the one thing that people appear to be missing and I'm obviously keen to hear what your thoughts are on it is is it's the, the methodology to overcome fear, because fear seems to be the thing that is holding each profile back, yeah. whether it is a fear of taking up space, whether it is a fear that if I don't do it, no one else will, so I need to take charge, um, whether it's a fear of not being dependable. Does that play a role in, in this at all? I think you're, you've nailed it. I mean, I really think there is something that's fundamental about all of us in terms of, you know, we said right at the beginning, are we doing it because we're amateur sleuths and we're curious or are we doing it because we're mitigating fear? Because there's something about our early life where we have, you know, a healthy dose of fear. We are little in the world and we have to work out what brings our caregivers closer and actually what pushes them further away, what gets us accepted, what gets us rejected. One of the things I find so fascinating about human development is that human beings, human babies, are the only mammal that is born 12 months prematurely. So effectively, if you compare us to the rest of the mammal kingdom, we are the animals that emerge into this world completely helpless. And there is a reason for that. It's so that our brains can develop a more nuanced set of synapses that we're going to need for the particular life we're going to live in. So we are, we have the potential to live on a Tibetan hillside or to live in London and present the weather. We have the capacity to be all things at the point that we're born. But what we actually do then is start to develop and tailor what we end up with. So by the age of one, we have we have burnt through much of that potential in terms of our brain and its its makeup and we have become a set of adaptations and really when we look at blind spots and the profiles that's what we're talking about a set of adaptations based on an element of fear healthy fear about how do i survive you know because that's really what it's supposed to be it's about keeping us safe what i find fascinating is that as we grow up I mean, those risks change. We aren't necessarily dependent upon others to survive in the way that we legitimately are when we're tiny. So those adaptations we've made become actually what we would call maladaptations. They're not acting in service of us anymore. In fact, they're a handbrake on our lives. So we're still driven by fear, but there is nothing to be afraid of, or certainly we have the resources to resolve that fear. So when we talk about overcoming fear, What I think we actually need to do is update our understanding of what the risks are to us. And I talk about this a lot. I say that in life, we have two options when it comes to fear. We either need to find out what's there or we need to resource ourselves so that we can be truly resilient. 
what the blind spots do is they help us avoid and eliminate something that we're afraid of. And all that does is serve to kind of reinforce that fear. So I think I think you're absolutely right. This is a fear, a fear problem. So much of our fear does come from our, as especially as we move through move through life, it comes from our learned experiences, and you know, uh, our, our our brain does everything it can to steer us away from from pain or harm or or stress, and normally that leads straight into stress, which is yeah. hilarious because you think that's <laughs> one bit of brain sort of gets wrong because it's so busy avoiding, and not actually dealing with the thing that you know. Once we mm -hmm. dealt with it, actually we'd be fine. Um, but so much as well as we go through life, and when you talk about blind spots, is is unlearning what we know, but then also learning to fill the gaps in our blind spots. Yeah. And I think it makes me really sad when I hear people say, "Well, this, this is just how I am. It is how it is. I'm not changing now. I'm too set in my ways." And they can say this from the 30s. Oh yeah. And actually, this is around. This is exactly the right spot um, yeah. to to start taking a look at. Do you know what's not serving me? What can I what can I unlearn? And where do I think the blind spots are that I'm either deliberately or subconsciously I'm not looking at certain behaviors yeah. in others or behaviors in myself that actually I can unpack a little bit and my life would be so much more joyful if I yeah. just did that. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I think there's really something about understanding that those rigid patterns we've got into, it's interesting when you're talking about stress and the way the brain works with stress, because that's the problem. Our brain actually isn't designed to steer us away from stress. Our brain is singly designed to steer us towards survival. And if it has established early on that, I use the example in the book, that uh, when my daughter does a handstand and one summer, you know, unfortunately she gets stung by a bee and it's, it's a, one of those things and for her that then leads to a process of understanding that actually doing gymnastics in the garden in the summer is dangerous in fact bees are dangerous and perhaps being outside is dangerous and that's the way our brain is designed to protect us and I think part of this is about becoming really understanding and compassionate towards some of those fear reflexes because we know don't we that when we are afraid we can't be we can't be shouted down. We have to be soothed and nurtured and reassured. And I think so much of our society criticizes fear as a response, as opposed to understanding it and giving it some love and attention, being able to say to my daughter, of course, of course, it's terrifying to go out and put your hands down on the grass again. That makes sense. You make sense. And I think that point in our society, sometimes we get locked into a position of trying to be at odds with our fear responses. So, and then we have to shut them down. We have to say, well, I'm just, this is how I am. I'm not changing. There's nothing to be gained here. Why would I rake all this up? And actually what we're saying is, well done brain for getting you to this point with those beliefs. That's great. Thank you. And now how about we look and see if there's anything else that might be relevant here? Anything else about the fact that there was a bee that one time, but here are all the other times that there weren't. So part of this for me is about not locking into a kind of a either or binary situation. It's about saying, yes, that and this. You know, when you talked about how you recognize that rocky part of you and how you were starting to spot profiles. And I was thinking back to a television career and wondering for you actually what that's like, because in my imagination, there are lots of gladiators working in television. And here comes a rock who's actually really good at working with other people's needs and not necessarily putting hers front and center. You know, rocks don't typically challenge gladiators. In some ways, we enable them because we don't take up the space and it's left for them. And I got curious about that, whether that's something that resonates with you. This just shows how good you are at your job, <laughs> <laughs> which is which is interesting. <laughs> because um, yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, I, in terms of profile, I mm. yes, of course, there are rocks who work in in television, uh, and it's and it's necessary. But yes, very much. I was I worked in a 
in an industry, but also in, in the type of programming that I worked in as well, that absolutely I was surrounded by gladiators. Yeah. And there were moments when me being the way that, that I am, which is I am very steady and very calm and I am very enabling uh, in a good way. Yeah. Um, that sometimes that was misunderstood and it was misunderstood as a weakness because if you're not shouting and banging tables, then it means you don't care as much or you're not as strong in your opinion. But what was, I think, fortunate anyway about about me was I I knew I didn't need to shout to prove that I felt strong in my opinions because I was I was pretty chilled in myself. Yeah. And I think once, obviously, I did it for so long. I worked in telly for over two decades. And even you know, when I presented Lusumin, I did that for 13 years. Yeah. It took a while for people to get used to my, my style. But I think what people then realized was there was so much safety in being around someone like me. Because one, I will challenge you, but I will always challenge you with the, I will give you an opportunity to explain yourself because I want to hear your opinion or I want you to defend yourself because if you really believe this strongly in whatever opinion that it is, I may have a totally opposite view, but I champion your right to express it and I'll support yeah. you in your expressing of it. And the good thing about me not being a gladiator is I don't, I don't feel competitive towards that. I don't feel combative towards that. And I think what made me so great to be an anchor rather than, uh, you know alongside my fellow gladiators who were all expressing their opinions was that one they knew they could rely on me to su to support them equally I would make sure that everybody had their opportunity to to speak and I would very often not bother say saying what I felt because I didn't think it was that important because I didn't feel the need to convince anyone with how yeah. I felt because I was all right with how I felt yeah and so for me I think that role actually worked really well yeah um <laughs> others might disagree but in in my head I felt that when you're when you're you know and I'm talking about it in terms of a of a panel show and a chat show and when you're hosting something that is live it's in front of a live studio audience you're broadcasting to millions of people at home you also have your employers to think about so you're, you're ticking so many boxes making sure you're you're pleasing and entertaining many many people at the same time if you're not solid in who you are and what you're capable of then the whole thing will derail yeah. so I I was all right with it um yeah that, that was yeah. just how I felt like I say not, not everyone necessarily agreed with that but I I was all right with it yeah I think that's fascinating Andrew because I suppose that's what I heard you saying is that actually you know what this is bigger than me this is I have a, a duty of care to a production team to my co-host to my audience in the in the room with me to the people who are going to actually engage in this it's something about rocks particularly we are very good at being responsible yeah. so there's something about being responsible but the challenge we have is do we get our own feelings and needs met or do we get a bit too good at being responsible and that tends to kind of be our I suppose it's the fault line, you know, if you think about those tectonic plates. And particularly for me, as I've kind of grown older, I've worked out that actually there is a leaf I want to take out of the book of the gladiator. And there is a leaf I want to take out of the book of the bridge and the hustler. That means yeah. I get what I'm aiming for and what I'm talking to clients about all the time, which is perspective. It's sometimes I get so busy trying not to be the bits that I don't like about the people who, you know, trigger me or distress me that I forget that actually that might be me projecting something I'm not comfortable with in myself onto them. And maybe there's a seed of truth in that. One of the things I found most fascinating, my dad would call himself, he calls himself a radiator, which is this combination of a rock and a gladiator. He's made that up. So that's now his, which is great. And I can see that in him, that he's got this brilliant ability to be able to kind of say, yes, you and me. And there's something really nice about that. You know, he can kind of be generous and leave space for a room and be very responsible. And obviously as a vet, he was, but he can also kind of come in and, you know, if there's a buffet, he's helping himself. He's not waiting to be offered to. And I talk about that as an analogy with clients all the time, the buffet of life. Like, what are we doing? Are you the one that's there making sure everyone else has what they need first? That would be me. Or are you the one that's there going, actually, you know what? There's enough for everyone. So I'm going to take until someone says, 
otherwise. And I just think some of this, how do we take little bits from all the different profiles? And like you said, on a panel show, that probably was the perfect combination to have those different ebbs and flows of voices and personalities to give us this kind of rich variety from which we can kind of get the broadest perspective. That's always how I saw it. And I always saw it as either I was conducting an orchestra or making yeah. a casserole. There were <laughs> my, my two sort of analogies. And for me, it was, um, I was either the conductor. So I was like, oh, they've been a bit quiet. Bring them up a little bit. Oh. Them, maybe calm that down a bit. And so that in the end, it was like a beautiful sound. Or it was a casserole, which was, you need sweet and sour. You need yeah. you need something that's got a bit of punch to it. But you also need something that's going to draw it back in. And yeah. so that was how I saw it. And then for me, at the end, when I when it when the you know the credits ran, it was like ta da! It's like brilliant. That was either a great piece of music or or dish or whatever. Yeah. And yes, I was responsible for it, but I didn't mm-hmm. necessarily have to, uh, you know make my voice heard but what is fascinating was I was really good at that in my professional life Mm. in my personal life not so much yeah and and I think this is something that many people will will also resonate with that we can yes have different different elements of the profiles that you mentioned but Mm. we bring different parts of ourselves to different elements of our life so whereas I always felt extremely calm and grounded and strong and capable when I was at work but in my personal life all over the place so weak so um uh very walked over very taken advantage of all of all of those things which you know someone from the outside might think well how on earth but I remember when I was going through uh, a particularly challenging time in one of my previous relationships and uh, I actually had to take um, take some advice. And the the woman that I was speaking with, she said, you know, you are not alone. I actually deal with one of my clients is actually a barrister. She's a female barrister. Yeah. She presents herself so powerfully to the outside world. But behind closed doors, there are some really terrible things happening to her. She's yeah. very... Uh, she can't let people know because she's worried people will think that she's weak. And people also might think, well, how can someone like that, who's so strong on this one side, also be weak on the other? And I, I wonder and if this is something that you've experienced where people in the outside world, they are the rock, the gladiator or the radiator. Love yeah. that analogy. <laughs> um, but actually, in other parts of their life, there's something that, you know, like the title of the book, that they are missing and they're not able to bring that side of them out. Yeah, a hundred percent. And one of the things I talk about in the book is is this kind of idea of, yes, the blends, but also different relationships in our lives. And I think what you're describing there is so fascinating because a bit like you were saying, you know, you were a conductor of an orchestra, you were a chef in a busy kitchen creating something for other people. Mm. So the responsibility you had the, legit, the legitimacy of your role was because it was in the interest of others. And I think for a rock where we wobble sometimes is when we are the one we have to make the priority. So we don't necessarily advocate as strongly on behalf of ourselves as we would do on behalf of someone else. We're really good at defending and protecting the rights of others less so when it comes to our own needs and feelings so there's something about as a rock we might for instance find ourselves brilliantly responsible at work like this barrister she has the legitimacy of her role actually there is an expectation on her she has a duty of care to others take all of that away where she has to put herself front and center say in a personal relationship and she doesn't have that same self-worth Fundamentally, it comes down to what we make important. And typically, rocks and bridges don't make themselves important. They have a kind of ability. A rock has a a brilliant ability up to a certain point to believe that they don't need to be important until push comes to shove and they're being abused, they're being walked over, they're being taken advantage of. Suddenly, they have to summon up all of that potency and respect that they offer others and they have to redirect it towards themselves. 
And exactly then, that's the point when they come into therapy. It's, I don't get it. What am I missing? I am capable. I am resilient. I'm resourceful. Why am I accepting this behavior? What am I missing? I'm curious as to whether there is a... um... A gender bias in terms mm. of any of them. Would you would you say that for you know for example we we've used the you know my analogy there and, and and touched on my experiences, but would you say that that is a typically female thing or is it something that you see in in both men and women in your practice? I would say that I would say that there is it's a, it's a generalization, but it's worth making that I I see more bridges and hustlers among females and I see I see typically more rocks and gladiators among males but I do think that's partly because our society has supported certain behaviors for generations in that gender bias so I am a rock at least I used to be very rocky my mother is not a typical a typical female she is as I say she is this kind of manhole wielding pregnant woman that's constantly thinking of others and as a result I don't have that same bias I haven't actually noticed it and it's it's funny because I was chatting before about this idea of I've not felt the gender gap in my life actually as as strongly as I do now when I'm becoming more aware of what I'm missing when I'm becoming less rock basically when I'm becoming more vulnerable and having more needs and making more demands on the world now I notice the gender gap but for me there's something about noticing that and it is a generalization women have often been encouraged to be quiet to be supportive to be nurturing to be facilitative to be a shadow at times and so they've either had to be a bridge and accept things as the way they've come to them, or they've had to be a hustler and try to kind of make down payments on a life that they want to live. You know, take that example of personal relationships. I see lots of women who have hustled their way into a relationship and hope that it's going to secure them. Hope that if they can just get themselves into that job, then they're going to feel some sense of achievement, except actually all they end up with is imposter syndrome. Because it didn't come from a space of self-belief. It came from a space of hustling. I suppose typically if I look at the men in the world and I talk about uh, CEOs and gladiators, but it's that energy, it's a masculine energy as opposed to it being a male bias. It's the masculine energy around this, being able to be kind of very forthright, being able to be very logical, being able to be more about thinking than feeling. Of course, that's the very reason that those men in this example come to therapy. They've been conditioned out of feeling their feelings and it's holding them back. It's not a strength. It's a disability. They don't have their feelings to act on. So they're trying to act on what they think the patriarchy wants or what they've been rewarded for in the past. I think there's so much that we can learn from each other. But as with all these things, it's about getting curious about what the other has to offer as opposed to pulling back to your bunkers and kind of digging in to how it's always been. Emma, if we could, if we could wrap up, and honestly, I could talk to you for days. <laughs> if we could, Let's just do that after. <laughs> we'll do that after. <laughs> but if we could, if we could wrap up on one final question, which is, if, if anyone watching this or listening to this is thinking, there is, there is some. I'm, okay, I'm resonating with this profile or this profile or this experience, but there is a part of me that feels like it's not quite right. What is the what is the question that you say to someone or what is the answer rather that you say to someone when they approach you with the question, what am I missing? So mm. if someone is thinking to themselves now, what am I missing? What would your answer be to, to help them guide themselves through it? Well, perhaps this is a bit of a confrontational answer, but I suppose I might say something like, what do you avoid? What do you dislike in other people? What turns you off? What bothers you? What triggers you? Those are the things not to lean away from, but to lean into, because there's probably going to be a seed of truth in that that you're missing. I love that. (laughs) I love that. That is such a great mic drop moment to end. That's perfect. Emma, thank you so much for this. And thank you for this, for the book. I will put the link to it so that uh, people can go and buy it in their droves. And I'll also put... um, 
all your your places where people can reach you as Amazing. well. I'm, I'm assuming it's Instagram and yep. online, all the places. All those bits. Thank you so much. I would appreciate that. And thank you so much for having me in this fantastic conversation. I hope you've enjoyed today's conversation. Remember to like and subscribe to this channel so you never miss a thing.